Our next keynote speaker is Ms. Bernhilde Omasdotto from Iceland. Ms. Omasdotto is a Secretary General of the Icelandic Women's Rights Association. A specific focus of the association is gender equality in politics and education, and it closely works with women active in political parties represented in Arsingi and with teachers in Iceland and the other Nordic countries. Ms. Mastoto will tell us what happened during the early phase of COVID-19 pandemic in Iceland. Title of her presentation is Gender Equality and Women in the Time of Plague. My dear friends in Japan, I want to begin by thanking you all for inviting me to speak again at your meeting. I have such fond memories of my last visit to your country, a visit which has become one of my more valued memories, especially today when I, like so many in the world, have been locked down within my own borders, unable to travel to new places and unable to meet new people face to face. I want to begin by showing you a picture. This is me. Same time last year, last summer in Akihabara, Tokyo. As you can see, I have a bemused look on my face since I have the strange feeling that the number of people I just saw on the streets of Tokyo that night was probably higher than the total population of Iceland, which is just over 360,000 people. Today, a year later, I am speaking to you from my apartment in Reykjavik, where I have been working for the past eight months, ever since the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic hit Icelandic shores. The COVID-19 pandemic is a global calamity, a pandemic that has affected all of us. It has changed our societies, the way that we live our lives, and for far too many of us, it has taken our lives. The differences between how different countries have fared during this epidemic have shown us that gender equality is actually one of the key indicators of how resilient a society is when dealing with the economic, social, and political effects of the pandemic. Today, I want to address the challenges that face us in the global work for gender equality. And it is true that we are facing some mighty challenges, but my talk won't be one of hopelessness because I myself am filled with hope. It is necessary for all of us who value equality to begin planning for the society we want to create when coming out of this pandemic. We are beginning to see glimmers of the path forward. In many ways, the pandemic has made our society more global than ever. I might not be able to travel to Japan to speak with you directly, yet here I am, sitting in my apartment in Reykjavik, speaking to all of you on the other side of the globe. Modern technologies have made it easier than ever to work on gender equality across borders, activists and academics and politicians meeting face-to-face -face via the computer screen. I want to structure my talk today in three sections. Uh, first, I want to begin by listing some of the challenges that we are facing during this epidemic, uh, focusing on the situation here in Iceland. Uh, then I want to talk about uh, recovery efforts, analyzing the, their impacts on women, and I want to end on a hopeful note, discussing gender equality and resilience, and begin to speculate how we can use the recovery from the pandemic as an opportunity to create a more gender equal world. Uh, this talk will, of course, in no way be comprehensive. I am giving a snapshot in time of a small corner of the world and only addressing part of the challenges that we are facing right now. Um, to date, around 1.5% of the population in Iceland has contracted COVID-19. The pandemic has had a great effect on how we live our lives. The government in Iceland has had to implement many restrictions on business and civil society. Since October, all bars have been closed, as are all swimming pools and health clubs, and all sporting and cultural events have been cancelled. Strict restrictions have been placed on those businesses that remain open. Only 10 people are allowed at a time into shops, restaurants and museums, with special exemptions for truck stores and food stores, which can admit 50 to 100 people at a time. Schools are still open, but schools at the secondary level and tertiary level, that is high schools and universities, have in many cases moved their classes online. And now, uh, the pandemic has not only had a social impact, but also a significant economic one. Okay. Uh, the greatest economic impact uh, has this been is me. on the tourist industry. 
The rapid decline of international travel and closing of various borders has had a detrimental effect on Iceland society and a catastrophic effect on the tourism industry. Iceland, like Japan, is an island nation, but unlike Japan, we are a small country located far away from re the rest of the world in the middle of the North Atlantic. For most of our history, we were isolated from the rest of Europe. Uh, you might have heard that there are no trees in Iceland, and that's really not an exaggeration, as you can see from the drone video now playing. Only about 1.2% of Iceland is covered with forests. Uh, this means that for most of our history, we were dependent on other nations for our contact with the world. Since we could not construct our own wooden ships, we had to rely on other nations to sail to Iceland to bring in goods and trade and to transport our people for study and travel abroad. This all changed in the 20th century when Iceland, for the first time, was in control of her own destiny, buying her own steel machinery, first boats and then planes. This connection with the rest of the world has meant everything to us here in Iceland. We as a culture value travel abroad and we welcome foreign visitors. This is because our connection with the world has widened our cultural horizons. Tourists and immigrants to Iceland have brought with them a new culture that has revitalized the Icelandic culture and made it so much more vibrant. Losing this connection, however briefly, has been psychologically devastating. And it has been economically devastating as well. The tourism industry plays an oversized part in the Icelandic economy. The travel industry accounts for about 30% of our exports. Last year, 20% of all credit card payments in Iceland were made with foreign credit cards. The collapse of this industry poses a great threat to the Icelandic economy. The numbers are stark when we look at the raw figures of people traveling through Keflavik Airport, Iceland's largest international airport. Uh, here you can see a graph of the departures of foreign travelers from Keflavik Airport uh, for the past four years. In October of this year, uh, 9,801 passengers departed the airport compared to 163,093 the year before, and in 2018, uh, 199,626 uh, people. This collapse of the tourism industry has had a devastating effect on the economy and well being of tens of thousands of families in Iceland. Around 15% of the people in the labor market work in the travel industry, and the majority of them are women. 50% of those working in hotels, restaurants, and tourist offices are women, and 57% of those working in the, in the service industry. Now, here is a chart of the number of unemployed people in Iceland in September of this year. Unfortunately, the graph is in Icelandic, but I will walk you through it. Uh, now, I want to, uh, before we start, I want to remind you all of how incredibly small the labor market is in Iceland, only 200,000 people. There were around 18,000 people unemployed this September in Iceland, a laughably small figure in Japan, a devastating number here in Iceland. This means that unemployment today is around 10%, having gone up as high as 17% earlier this year during the first wave of COVID-19. These are unprecedented numbers in a country which usually has unemployment hovering around 2%. Now here you can see uh, the sectors where unemployment is the highest. Uh, the tourist industry are the, to uh, the two bars here to the left. Uh, here on the far left you have people working in hotels and restaurants. And here you have people in the transport industry. This, these are all the people that were working uh, in the airline ind industry. Uh, the third highest uh, unemployment is in, uh, in uh, retail and, and wholesale. Uh, and uh, here we have uh, the rental and the housing industry. And uh, these two here bars are industry and construction respectively. These are two fields which are heavily dominated by men. As you can see, the uh, unemployment in these sectors is higher than it should be, but not as high as in the service sector, uh, which is disproportionately dominated by women. Uh, now we have set the economic stage. I want to address how the Icelandic government has tried to respond to these challenges and how these responses have failed to take into account gender. Because in the end, it's not really the challenges that are in, uh, the important factor in this conversation. It is how we as a society have dealt with it. Um, the Icelandic government passed a large recovery package in March, early on in the pandemic. The package was the largest in Icelandic history, 320 billion Icelandic kronas, 
or 1.6 billion US dollars, the equivalent to just under 8% of Iceland's GDP. This recovery package was heavily criticized by feminist groups and civil society since, despite being very large, it was not very responsive to the situation in Iceland. As we've seen, the pandemic has caused wide devastation in fields where women are majority workers, but the economic recovery package was heavily focused on construction work, building roads and infrastructure. 92% of those who work in construction are in Iceland are men, and the money in this package disproportionately benefits them. Following this criticism, the government passed a second bill, which was gender evaluated before its adoption. This, this second recovery package was much more gender sensitive than the first one, including social initiatives such as increased funding against gender-based violence and violence against children, increased support for senior citizens, support for families and caregivers of disabled children and immigrant children, support for job seekers and students, and support to independent media. Uh, despite the second recovery package, most of the budget allotted to COVID-19 recovery in Iceland in 2020 will benefit men. According to the government's own analysis, 85% uh, of all jobs that are created this year will go to men, a figure which is obviously unacceptable. Uh, here uh, you see a graph of the number of women and men working in the various sectors in Iceland. Uh, Again, I'm sorry that it's in Icelandic, but I will walk you through it. Uh, the red bars are women uh, and the mustard yellow are the men. Uh, now, as you can see here in the left uh, most bar, the vast majority of women work in the public sector. And these are the women that are working in healthcare, social services, care work, educated, and education and public administration. Uh, now here on the third bar to the, uh, from the right is the construction industry, an industry heavily dominated by uh, men, an industry which uh, most was most uh, impacted by the COVID-19 recovery package. So, and as you can see, uh, <laughs> uh, this is a sector which employs vastly fewer people than other fields, such as the public sector, wholesale and, re wholesale and retail trade, or the service industry here. So it really makes very little sense to plan an economic recovery around construction. When we look at public investment, investing in care work and welfare has a much greater immediate impact than investing in infrastructure. Investing in welfare creates more jobs because most of the cost in welfare goes towards real wages of workers, while much of the cost of construction goes towards buying materials. By investing in welfare rather than infrastructure, you are investing in people, not things. And this is something that we all need to keep in mind in the coming months and years, because the truth is, even if we are now seeing the light at the end of the tunnel with new vaccines being introduced and plans for distribution being made for next year, we still haven't started seeing the true repercussions of this epidemic on our society and the impact that it will have on women. Sometime soon, governments will want or need to talk about cutbacks in public spending. And when we look towards the history of earlier recessions, Government cutbacks have in the past disproportionately affected women. Remember this chart? Uh, in Iceland, uh, vastly more women than men work in the public sector, which means that women will be disproportionately affected if cutbacks are planned in public service without analyzing the impact of those actions based on gender. Not only will more women lose their jobs, but the care work that is now being performed in public institutions will move into homes to be shouldered by women. And this is where we, who work in gender equality and civil society, need to be ready with a cohesive action plan to ensure that all future recovery efforts be gender inclusive and that they benefit all genders in our society equally. Because things will become better and I believe that we can uh, emerge from this epidemic a stronger and more inclusive and more equal society. I believe this because this is our experience here in Iceland, that from catastrophic change comes a stronger and more equal society. When the global financial crisis caused the collapse of the Icelandic banking system in 2008, women emerged stronger for it. In the elections that followed the crash, women finally broke the glass ceiling uh, in parliament and went from being 28% of uh, parliament to 38%, a number that hasn't really gone down since then. And the legislation that has been passed by a more gender equal parliament in the past decade is legislation that has had real and direct impact on the status of women in Iceland. 
Now, the high number of women in politics doesn't automatically mean that our parliament gets it right when thinking through the impact of legislation on women and men, as we can see from the decisions that were made earlier this year planning uh, the COVID-19 recovery package. But it makes the parliament more responsive to criticism, as we saw in the second and more gender balanced COVID-19 recovery package. And it is important that women take equal part in the conversation and the decision making in our global recovery efforts following COVID-19. Here's a picture of our Prime Minister Katrin Jakobsdottir on a Zoom meeting with other women world leaders earlier this year. The subject of discussion is the impact of COVID-19 on gender equality and the status of women. I include this picture to illustrate my next point, that it is absolutely vital that we work to ensure that women are equally represented at all levels of our government on the local, the national, regional and the global level. Because we are heading for turbulent times politically, and when I look at my neighbouring countries, both here in Europe and across the Atlantic, I cannot state unhesitatingly that our free and social democracy is stable. Women's rights and democracy is under attack in the era of COVID-19, with governments all over the world using the pandemic as an excuse to pass laws and regulations restricting civil rights. Here in Europe, when COVID-19 first hit, Hungary passed a new set of coronavirus measures that included jail terms for spreading misinformation and gave no clear time limit to the state of emergency, allowing the Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, to rule by decree. This was the first such legislation put into place in Europe since Germany passed similar legislation in 1933, the Enabling Act which gave Adolf Hitler his power. The right of assembly is the cornerstone of democracy, but restrictions put in place by many countries because of COVID-19 has undermined these rights. And one country in Europe which has used these restrictions as an opportunity to restrict civil rights is Poland. Since 2016, the Polish government has tried several times to pass legislation restricting women's rights to abortion. Earlier attempts have been foiled by women and men flooding the streets of Polish cities in protest. Now, however, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, more, no more than five people are allowed to assemble in Poland at any one time. This means, of course, that an authoritarian government has an opportunity to pass controversial legislation without the threat of protest. This opportunity was seized by Poland's constitutional court last month when it passed a ruling outlawing almost all abortion. However, that decision backfired, prompting the largest protest in Poland since the fall of communism. Uh, the government has, for the moment, delayed implementing the court decision because of this protest. I offer these two examples of how COVID-19 has allowed authoritarians around the world to, to use the pandemic as an excuse to pass illiberal legislation. Just yesterday, when preparing my talk, news broke that the EU is now facing a crisis after Hungary and Poland vetoed the bloc's historic budget and coronavirus recovery plan over attempts to link funding to respect for democratic norms. These are indeed perilous times we are facing, the serious challenges, not only financial instability, but also attacks on women's rights and democracy on the local and global level. But as I said earlier, I wanted my talk to be hopeful, not hopeless. I wanted to talk about solutions and not challenges and about a better future and not a dystopian one. And despite the challenges that we face, I am very hopeful indeed, uh, because these challenges are not new. They are old challenges challenges that we already know how to solve. COVID-19 has not created inequality in our society. It has merely exposed the fault lines that are already existing in our system. The pandemic has disproportionately affected women, people of color, poor people, disabled people, old people, the very people that have historically been marginalized and disenfranchised in our society. To fix these problems, we need to continue our work to enfranchise these groups in our society making sure that they have a fair and equal share in all decision-making, economic benefits and social justice. And I firmly believe that countries that are more equal will in the end prove to be more resilient to the impact of COVID-19. Equality is a cornerstone of a resilient society. It distributes burdens as well as benefits equally and gives society a greater buffer against economic turbulence. Let's look at uh, gender equality specifically and how it makes society more resilient. 
if we had a panic button, we'd be hitting it. Women are exiting the labor force en masse, and that's bad for everyone. This is a headline from my recent Time Magazine article on the impact of COVID-19 on women in the workplace in the United States. The headline is quoting Rachel Thomas, the CEO of Lean In, a gender equity advocacy group co-founded by Facebook executive Sheryl Sandberg, uh, referring to figures that were recently published showing that 865,000 women in the United States uh, dropped out of the labor force compared to 216,000 men. The reason for women exiting the labor force can in part be attributed to the fact that female dominated industries have been hardest hit by the COVID-19 recession, not only in the United States and Iceland, but also on a global level. But uh, the article continues, this explains only part of the picture. Women in the United States are leaving the job market not because their jobs have vanished, but because their support systems have. Schools and daycares in the U.S. have closed, and the full-time job of caring for and educating children has fallen disproportionately on women. The economic impact of women leaving the workplace is not only devastating for the women themselves and their families, but for society as a whole. Women's work is a key driver of economic growth everywhere. Now, I want to contrast these figures to the situation here in Iceland, where in September the unemployment rate for women and men was just about the same. Here are the unemployment numbers for Iceland for last September. As you can see, the unemployment of women and men is the same, hovering around 11.4% for women and 10.8% for men. This is because Iceland's gender equal policies have created a buffer, allowing us as a society to weather the economic instability of COVID-19. I want to end by highlighting the two most important policies which have proven immeasurably important to maintaining our society during these trying times. Uh, first, parental leave, paid parental leave. Women in Iceland don't have to leave the workforce when we have children because we have paid parental leave divided equally between parents. The parental leave in Iceland is now 10 months, four months tied to each parent and two months to share. There is now a proposal before Parliament increasing this leave to 12 months, allotting six months to each parent. By tying our parental leave to both parents, we have increased the participation of men in household work, and we have made it possible for women to return to the workplace much sooner. And secondly, uh, we have affordable uh, universal daycare in Iceland. Each child has a guaranteed access to daycare from the age of two, and uh, virtually all Icelandic day, uh, children are in daycare uh, at that age. Daycare is also offered to younger children, if not guaranteed, and by the age of one, 50% of Icelandic children are in daycare. And by offering universal daycare, we give parents of all genders an opportunity to return to the workforce, an opportunity that we in Iceland take. Universal daycare was introduced in the 90s, and this is when uh, women started participating fully in uh, the labor market. Uh, the labor force participation of women in Iceland has been just about the same for the past uh, 20 years, hovering around 80%. I believe that these policies, among other gender equality policies that we have enacted here in Iceland, means that our social and economic recovery will be much quicker than it will be in other countries such as in the United States. Uh, gender equality has not only made Icelandic society uh, more resilient against the uh, economic threat, but it, so, it has also made us more resilient against the democratic threats that various countries in the world are facing. Women now make up 38% of parliament and 48% of local governments in Iceland. Uh, this here is our current cabinet, five uh, women and six men. Our Prime Minister, our Minister of Health, Minister of Justice, Minister of Education and Culture, and our Minister of Tourism, Industry and Innovation are all women. This means that decisions that are being made on the national level in Iceland and on the local level as well, are being made with the full participation of women, which drastically decreases the risk of our government passing legislation that is actively harmful toward women. Uh, COVID-19 is a disease and it does not discriminate on the basis of gender or, in, or on the color of our skin, but we do. We must work together to ensure that this pandemic does not increase inequality. We must actively pressure our governments to enact recovery measures that help everyone in our society, not just a few. 
And we must ensure that future cutbacks following this pandemic will not mainly affect the vulnerable in our society, uh, women, low-paid workers, immigrants, and other marginalized groups. By making gender equality the lodestar of our recovery efforts, we can build back a better, more equal, and more just society than we had before when the pandemic started. And we will do this work together, learning from the experience of others, fostering global communication and global care. It is not enough to raise the status of women in one country. We must raise the status of women in all countries. We women can never really be free and equal if our sisters outside our national borders remain oppressed. Today, we communicate via Zoom and we begin our work planning a better tomorrow via digital means. But soon enough, we will be meeting again in the real world. And I look forward to that time, my sisters and brothers and siblings in Japan, when we can meet face to face to continue our work towards a gender equal future. Thank you. What an inspiring keynote speech. Icelandic experiences of COVID-19 tell us one important lesson. That is, our gender parity at political arena does not automatically guarantee gender responsive policies. We Japanese sometimes consider Iceland is a role model of gender equality due to the global gender gap rankings. At the time of public health crisis, however, even the Icelandic government prioritized construction sector, for example, which is a heavily male dominated sector. In order to push back such a policy, advocacy work of civil society organizations will play a key role. I was also very much impressed by your statement that COVID-19 is not a new challenge, but they are the old challenges. It reveals to which extent our society has been resilient to support the vulnerable groups of the people at the time of the plague. Thank you so much, Brunson, for your message to the Japanese audience. This is the end of the part one. Please continue to enjoy part two, country reports from Indonesia and Vietnam. <laughs>